Welcome to The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Listen to Joe tackle the really tough moral issues, current events, and politics from a Catholic perspective. Now here's Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Hello again, Sixpack Warriors. Welcome back to The Cantankerous Catholic, episode 212. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me, according to the regulation and uniform code of military justice. So help me God. If you're listening to my voice right now, that's a pretty certain sign that you're a conservative. After all, I'm a constitutional conservative and a theological conservative. But being a self-proclaimed conservative might not be so good. That's what we're going to talk about this week. There's little doubt in anyone's mind that society in America is in a state of entropy and utter chaos. So what are you going to do about it? Wise families are preparing for that real caca hits the fan moment. Most don't know how to do it properly though. There's so much to think about when preparing to protect your family. It's overwhelming. In How Your Family Can Survive When Society Collapses, I've done all the research for you. In this comprehensive guide, I tell you everything you need to know to be able to protect your family and learn how to live off the grid. In fact, following the things I teach in this book will not only help you to survive, but your family will actually be able to prosper. Get your copy of How Your Family Can Survive When Society Collapses now, today, while there's still time to prepare. You'll find a link in my show notes at cantankerouscatholic.com or you can go to the book section on the Joe's Stuff page. Before I get started, I have a few things I want to mention. First, my cousin Mikey was the closest thing to a brother I've ever had. In fact, we refer to each other as brothers. He was a highly decorated career combat soldier in the Army for 22 years. Like all the men in my family, Mikey served our country with pride and honor. Now he's really suffering. 
He's having organ failure, and despite having VA medical care, this has really put he and his wife behind the eight ball financially. So I'm asking you for help. The goal I've set to help him is $5,000. I realize that the economy is in a mess, and that's hurt a lot of you, but I'd really appreciate it if you'd help this lifelong Patriot combat veteran with anything you could give. If possible, it would be especially nice if 50 of you would step up to the plate and give $100 each so I don't have to ask for his help again next week. Pat and Kimberly Burt picked up on the Sharing the Catholic Faith webinars last Sunday. If you missed it, I have two things to say to you. You missed something great, and shame on you for not being there. This couple is a great example of Catholics doing something. If you want to begin to get invitations to these webinars, just get your name and email on any one of my mailing lists. Pat and Kimberly are looking forward to sharing the Catholic faith with you. I want to remind you that we need questions for Bishop Strickland. The holidays are behind us, so everyone has time to think a bit. Ask all the questions you have always wanted to ask a bishop. Bishop Strickland is the only bishop in America with the guts to do and say what a bishop should say and do. So don't be afraid to ask. Ask your questions. Send them to me at joe at cantankerouscatholic.com or go to my website at cantankerouscatholic.com and send me a message from the Reach Joe page. Now let's get to the topic at hand. Conservative. What does that even mean today? Six-pack warriors are conservatives or you wouldn't be so loyal to this show. But are you conservative or a conservative activist? There's a difference, you know. Conservatives are just passive complainers, sissies. They claim to want to conserve something, and in this case, it would either be the Constitution in the political arena or the constant 2,000-year teaching of the Catholic Church in the theological arena. The problem with that is all conservatives do is complain that our Constitution and Church are being taken away from us. Conservative activists, on the other hand, are willing to boldly fight for what they love dearly enough to save from destruction. I know many of you are political conservative activists, but what about the Catholic Church? On January the 11th, Michael Voris did one of his daily vortexes titled, Conserve What Exactly? In that vortex, he talked about political and religious conservatism. Before I comment further, I'd like for you to listen to this seven-minute clip from The Vortex. Then I'll come back and expound on what Michael is saying. A few years back, I was visiting with a noted archbishop in his office about the dire state of the church, and consequently, of course, the world. I asked him if he and the other bishops of his mind huddled up regularly, if they called each other, got together, formed organizations with each other, sat on each other's boards of directors, and all that kind of thing. He looked at me somewhat puzzled and said, well, you're, and I said back to him, well, your enemies in the Episcopate do that, and they do have enemies. He answered me back and said, well, no, we don't. Conservatives tend to conserve. And that right there is a perfect sum up of everything wrong in the church, as well as the world when it comes to the so-called good guys. Conservatives, whatever that empty term has now come to mean, well, they're delusional. They fail to either understand or admit that their enemies play for keeps. They actually want them, us, dead. There seems to be a the this sort of Marcus of Queensberry rules approach to the political and mostly spiritual battle raging around us, like politeness should rule the day, tisk tisk. But what is spoken of as politeness and charity is really just a mask covered, covering cowardice an unwillingness to not go to war and not do what needs to be done. There's something, some disease in the psychology of people who self-identify as conservative, be it in politics or the church, and most especially in the church, because they get to baptize their softness and portray themselves as religious and somehow above the fray, true Catholic gentlemen. That's hogwash. 
maybe in some dystopian Victorian turn of the last century front parlor genteel sitting in their minds that they can't think that way. But unfortunately for them and us, the world, well, it's not tracking with that. But this problem of the soft approach, it isn't new. Take, for example, this historical passage from 1871. 1871. What was the resisted novelty of yesterday is today one of the accepted principles of conservatism. It is now conservative only in affecting to resist the next innovation, which will tomorrow be forced upon its timidity and will be succeeded by some third revolution to be announced and then adopted in its turn. In short, so-called conservatives always give in. They don't fight. They don't even really resist. At first, they protest a little bit here or there, but in the end, they always give in. We see this in politics constantly, for example. You never hear about the left complaining and scratching their heads over a liberal Supreme Court justice suddenly flipping and becoming conservative. That gate only swings one way. But in the church, it's even more pronounced, so much so that there's a long-standing joke among priests that part of the consecration rite for being made bishop includes the removal of the spine. The world is not even. It tilts toward evil. It gravitates towards it. The inclination of man is always towards the selfish act, even if here or there that is overcome any victory is almost always short-lived. This is the fundamental reality that conservatives seem to either not grasp or they refuse to admit. Good people have to climb uphill. Bad people get to run down it. So the idea that you just hold your ground is a losing proposition to begin with in the face of an enemy attacking. Playing defense always loses. Sooner or later, the forces storm and overcome the castle. They do breach the walls. That is why our blessed Lord positioned his church to be on the offensive, not sit back and <clears throat> conserve. Conserve what exactly? A losing position? When he handed Peter the keys of the kingdom after saying he would build his church upon him, notice, by the way, church, not churches, one church, his church, then he said, the gates of hell would not prevail against it. That was a command from the divine general for his army to attack. It was hell that assumed the defensive posture of sitting behind its gates. The Son of God had come into the world to bring a full-on assault to the kingdom of darkness. These two kingdoms, only one would win, only one could win. Borrowing a line from old westerns, there's not enough room in this town for both of us. So on the attack they went, the apostles, their disciples, the next generation, and so forth. They converted an empire, not because they conserved, but because they attacked. They spent 500 years after that, converting barbarians. The next few hundred, fashioning Western civilization. None of this was done with a conservative mindset, just the opposite, in fact. But then came the next few centuries, and the warriors grew fat and lazy built their own castles, and hunkered down in them. And we know the rest of the story, and today we are led, both in the culture and most especially in the church, by conservatives. Dear God, spare us from conservatives. This mindset needs to be broken. St. Paul was not a conservative. None of the apostles were conservative. Our Lord absolutely was not conservative. We can conserve everything we want. Once evil is defeated, but as long as we are here, conservatism is a sure loser. So lose the polite attitude. It's for delusional sissies. Your enemy wants you dead. They want your heads on pikes and your children enslaved. Conservative means coward, an unwillingness to confront what needs to be confronted, and not just confronted, but attacked and defeated. That's how the left acts. It's why they're always winning, and conservatives, far from conserving anything, are always in retreat. Stop conceding, stop compromising, stop all of it. 
Isn't it clear by now that's a losing strategy? Heck, it's not even a strategy. The good guys suffer from much, beginning with hapless leaders. Unless the rank and file rise up and demand accountability, you might as well just sign up right now and support sex changes for your children, giving up your gas stoves in your house, getting your booster every six months and everything else the left crams down your throat. The idea of being conservative has got to be jettisoned from the lexicon of the people of God. As I said earlier, many of you are political conservative activists. That's a good thing, and you should certainly continue that. I'm a political activist as well. I keep my state senator in a constant physical state of diarrhea. He dreads hearing from me because I hold his feet to the fire. And I'll never stop being a political activist. However, politics isn't the only area where we need to fight. It's not even the most important arena to fight in. Frankly, we've lost the fight in the political arena. Our activism holds the leftists back for a little while, and we gain the occasional victory. However, things have gone so far with the diabolical left that the only way we're ever going to win in the political arena is to first restore the church Christ established. The Catholic Church is responsible for the formation of Western civilization. In order to save both the church and our country is to make the bishops of the criminal empire USCCB accountable. That doesn't mean signing petitions, writing letters to your bishop, or calling the chancery. You actually have to get out there and fight. And for that, I recommend church militant resistance. There'll be a link in my show notes for this episode on cantankerouscatholic.com. Joe Gallagher will help you every step of the way to learn how to fight the faithless and cowardly bishops of the USCCB. Referring to the church, the one and only that he called his church, Jesus said, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Gates are a defensive measure. That means it's our obligation to be on the offensive against hell. And we were on the offensive until bishops, priests, and laity got fat and lazy a few hundred years ago. Being fat and lazy is exactly how we ended up in this shape in the first place. Jesus commanded us to be on the offensive. He also told us to obey all his commands. So it does you no good to sit back and say, Well, in the end, Jesus wins anyway. That's the way cowardly and lazy Catholics think. And it won't work when you stand before Almighty God for your judgment. You must either fight for Christ and His church now, or you risk your immortal soul. If Catholics have any hope of returning the country to God, our families to God, then we need to match and surpass the intensity of the Marxists. It's impossible to turn on the news and not see another victory from the anti-family woke crowd. You cannot create any meaningful change by sitting back and just consuming podcasts and signing online petitions. Church Milton's Call to Action Convention is the blueprint for taking back the church and the culture. We've assembled a team of panelists that have unseated politicians, exposed corrupt clergymen, and saved the unborn, not to mention converted people to the one true faith. And now we are asking you to get involved. What you put into this is what you we'll get out of it. So please sign up at cmresistance.com and we'll show you exactly how you can begin to change your local community to be God-fearing, pro-family, and true to our country's values of life, liberty, and the pursuit of true happiness. It's time for the Sacred Heart Wins with Bishop Joseph Strickland. Each week, His Excellency answers your toughest questions about the Catholic faith, the problems in the church, spiritual questions, catechetical topics, or anything else you want to know. If you have a question, just email it to joe at cantankerouscatholic.com. Now here's Bishop Strickland and Joe Sickpack, the Every Catholic Guy. Six-Pack Warriors, I'm here with Bishop Strickland of Tyler, Texas. I'm ready to ask your questions, and he's ready to answer your questions. How are you today, Bishop? Good, Joe. How are you? 
oh, just as happy as a tornado in a trailer park. I say that too much, I guess. <laughs> uh, Excellency, last week, Deb wanted to know about your thoughts on the Sabatine privilege. You didn't know about the Sabatine privilege, and it's been so long since I've done anything with it that, uh, you know, had to explain it to anyone that I forgot a lot of the details. So I downloaded from the net something that uh, was written about it, and it's very accurate, exactly the way I remembered it, some things that I'd forgotten. If I can, I'd like to read it to you, and then uh, you can comment on what you think about it, okay? Sure. Okay. Uh, the Sabatine privilege is one of the most important messages of our Blessed Mother. It is based on the papal bull issued March 3rd, 1322, by Pope John the Twenty Second, This privilege was approved and confirmed by many popes, including St. Pius X, uh, I'm sorry, St. Pius V. It essentially says those who wear the brown scapular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, and I, I have for 35 years, and fulfill two other conditions, can obtain early liberation from purgatory through the special intercession of the Virgin Mary on the day consecrated to her, which is Sabbath, which is Saturday. Uh, for example, if a person had fulfilled the three conditions of the Sabatine privilege previously and dies on Tuesday, he or she will be liberated from purgatory on Saturday. And just for clarification, it, they're just using that as an example. It's any day of the week. Uh, the two other conditions are observe chastity according to one state in life and recite the little office of the Blessed Virgin Mary daily with the permission of a priest. You can replace that with the daily rosary. So essentially then this is <laughs> a get out of jail free card. <laughs> so what do you think about the Sabatine privilege? What are your thoughts? Well, um, as you describe it, certainly I am aware of the, the brown scapular and everything you've talked. I've just never heard it called the Sabbatine privilege. I guess that's tied to Sabbath, Sabbatine, Saturday, Our Lady's Day. Um, but certainly all of those pious practices are about really living the faith. If you look at each of the require, I mean, living chastely, absolutely. <laughs> praying in that form of the, the little office of Our Lady or substituted by a rosary. Certainly, all of those pious practices simply are ways to reinforce what the Blessed Mother says in the Scriptures. She points to her son and says, do what he tells you. And that's that's what it comes down to. The Like the brown scapular, which I'm wearing right now, um, is is a way of reminding ourselves. So it, they're very human. Um, the these pious practices and people say, "Oh, it's superstition." It's not. It's not superstitious. It's reminding us of the power of grace and how we open our hearts and minds and bodies to that power. So I think we need to rekindle a lot of those pious practices. Amen that have fallen by the wayside. Um, but certainly, as you describe it, the Sabatine privilege or the wearing of the brown scapular and the spiritual practices that go with it just remind us that we're called to be saints. We're called to be imitators of our Lord and of his mother, who is the woman. She's not divine, but she shows us a mere human can do this. Yes, she's protected from sin, which is a big uh, gift, but she's only human. She's fully human, and she shows us that, you know, we could always use the excuse, well, he's also the Son of God, so following Jesus. But Mary shows us that a human being can do this when they're filled with God's grace, and that's what it's about, being more filled, even as sinners, we can more and more turn to God's grace. I that's an excellent feedback, Excellency. The 
again, like uh, uh, restating what you said, this is merely living the gospel message. But because it's showing devotion to Mary, she's willing to get us kicked out of purgatory early. <laughs> so, yeah. and, and you want to know the truth. That's why I began practicing the Sabatine privilege 35 years ago, <laughs> because listen, I'm going to have to spend a lot of time in purgatory without it. Robert asks, the recent and sudden announcement by the Vatican to lay aside Father Frank Pavone puzzles many of us faithful Catholics. To those of us who are pro-life and faithful believers, the manner in which this has taken place is scandalous and certainly does not bring any further confidence in the actions of the Vatican. If the Jesuit priest, this is an excellent point, if the Jesuit priest, Father James Martin, can preach, teach, and write anything about pro-homosexual views with no public or apparent admonitions from our Jesuit Pope or others in the Vatican, then what should us faithful Catholic? I'm sorry, then what us faithful Catholics see is pharisaical hypocrisy. I'm mad as hell right now and won't give another dime to Peter's Pence collection uh, or give any financial support to the USCCB as long as we have this double standard. Seems to me that you and only a handful of other bishops have any backbone anymore. <laughs> okay, so your thoughts on that, Excellency? Is there a question <laughs> <laughs> I think it was um, a rant more than anything, but I guess yeah. he wants to know well, how you feel and, about and it. And I, you know, I understand the this person's rant and the anger and the confusion and the I'll even use the word disgust uh, that many have. Um, the only thing that I really can say is it's the ecclesiastical politics. Um, it's not really looking at what's the church about? What are we supposed to be teaching? It's the politics that, you know, um, and that's kind of where I'll leave it. it. But to me, I mean, it's sad. I mean, politics shouldn't override what the church is about, the salvation of souls, teaching the truth that Jesus Christ died and rose to share with us. But that, I mean, we're human. The church is holy, but human. And it's the, the political uh, maneuverings that that is involved in more than anything having to do with faith. Now, you have been critical of Father Martin in the past, I believe, haven't you? Yes. Uh, there's sort of an ongoing feud. I've never met him. I pray for him, as we should pray for every soul on the planet. But uh, certainly, I, sadly, I've been contacted by numerous people who have thanked me for speaking up against Amen. the heresy that he talks about, because it harms people right here and now. It's guiding people into darkness. And many people that have awakened and come out of that darkness say, you know, it's just devastating that his voice is so loud and so supported in the culture and in the church when he's not speaking the truth. And he, you know, so um, we have to be very clear that of the truth of the word of God, of the catechism, of the tradition of our faith. And the the homosexual issue is something that is very difficult, but the truth sets us free. And um, I speak up against what Father Martin does because he's he's not representing the truth according to Scripture. I mean, you I'm sure you could quote passage after passage, just saying, listing. I mean, in Romans is one of them where St. Paul lists, this is immoral, this is wrong, this is the way of sin. And to say that needs to be understood in a different way, that's just contrary to the tradition and the truth that we know. And and like I said, the, what 
confirms that for me is the people that have contacted me. I mean, sadly, it's sort of a, a side issue of all that, but it's all woven together. But I'm sure we've both seen numerous people who have gone through the the transgender journey and awakened at some point, realizing what God made them is what they should have just stayed with and tried to understand themselves better instead of trying to reinvent themselves. It's just devastating to people, and to be promoting that is further devastation. So it's just, it, it's a sad place for us to be, but um, with the Father Pavone versus Father Martin issue, it's it's politics. It's the, the political maneuverings, and uh, sadly, that's where we are. Yeah, just for the record, I haven't had an opportunity yet to dig deeply into this Father Pavone situation, but there may very well indeed be good reason for laicizing him based on what I've uh, discovered so far. However, Robert makes an excellent point that it's a, it's a double standard. And as far as I can tell, I, I personally don't know of any other bishop besides you who has taken a public stand, uh, I should say any bishop besides you in America, uh, who has taken a public stand against Father Martin, and uh, it really kind of aggravates me to call him Father. But, uh, you know, it's uh, Michael Voris has told before where he has talked to bishops who have said, oh, Father Martin's not allowed in my diocese. And then he makes the point, yes, he's in your diocese every single day through social media. And your people are out there reading that. And so why don't you write something to all of your flock? Uh, you know, tell them they shouldn't be listening to him. He makes a good point there. You, you're like me. You just open your big mouth and let him have it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So I think that was very good. Excellency, that's all we have for this week. It's been great to be with you on the show again. And uh, I'm getting a lot of good feedback. Not many questions, but a lot of good feedback. Uh, about how well you're doing with these. So uh, we'll see you next week, okay? Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Excellency. Everyone searches the Internet to solve problems or fill needs they have. For many of you, I've already done the heavy lifting. Discounting the evil things search for online, people generally search for things that tell them how to make money online, health and wellness products, and trading and investing. Some are interested in having their own podcast. I've got your back on these things. Visit cantankerouscatholic.com. Go to the episodes page, then click on the title of this episode. Below the podcast player, you'll see my show notes. I've already listed products and services in various groupings. Check them out. You can help yourself and this apostolate at the same time because if you like what you see and purchase the products or services, this apostolate will get a small commission. Check out those links today. It's time for the Catholic Boot Camp with your drill sergeant, Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Learn the Catholic faith and how to defend it like you've never heard it before. This boot camp is tough, so there's no political correctness, no spirit of Vatican II, and no namby-pamby platitudes. Drill Sergeant Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, will prepare you for spiritual war. Now here's Joe Sixpack. A little boy was watching his father work as he was building a piece of furniture. The man was using a level to make certain the board he was planing was straight and flat. The little boy thought this was fascinating, but also a lot of extra work. What's the use of being so careful, Dad? That board looks all right. Guessing won't do when building furniture, son, his father explained. 
You have to be spot on. Otherwise, your job will be a failure. Many people guess at too many things. What kind of things, Dad? At living the right way, for instance. They live the way they feel like living, and God doesn't like that. We ought to have a level to live by, don't you think, Dad? We do, son. The commandments of God and of the church is our level. Live according to that, and you won't be taking chances with your soul. You can do a good job in life only if you use that level. God is the judge of the job we're doing in life. If you do his will and follow his directions, he'll be pleased with your job and reward you. The directions that show his will are the Ten Commandments and the commandments of the church. They tell you how to love God, your neighbor, and yourself. They're the level of living right. Obviously, I want to write today about living for God according to his holy will. But first, I want to dwell on a few observations I made in my own walk with God to help us better understand his immensity and power. I'm a guy, obviously. Most of us guys aren't particular fans of pastels in clothing or our art. There's nothing wrong with pastels, but men usually have little or no use for them. I'm probably a little more extreme than most guys, as I genuinely hate pastels. I do. I absolutely hate them. Yet God always does a magnificent job with pastels. Have you ever bothered to give thought to the brilliance and beauty of a sunrise or sunset? Since I've had a stroke and now spend a lot of time in my wheelchair on our home's deck, I also spend a lot of time watching sunrises and sunsets. God is the only artist I know who can take pastels, the only colors making up a sunrise or sunset, and make them breathtakingly gorgeous. Imagine an artist with a canvas as big as the entire sky. Before the stroke, I was like the dad in our story, as I used to build and carve furniture. My favorite woods to work with were figured maple, cherry, and walnut. I'd take each and every piece of wood and look closely at the grain, texture, color, and character flaws to decide where each piece should be arranged in my furniture project. Each piece of wood has its own unique characteristics, and each piece has its own immense beauty. Sometimes I would think about how God allowed the tree that piece of wood came from to germinate 30, 40, or 50 years earlier, and that in his eternal mind he knew that I'd one day be holding that piece of wood and thinking about how I would best showcase his handiwork in my furniture. He knew what I'd build with each piece of wood before I was even a furniture maker or the tree was even a sapling. I guess he made at least part of the tree for me. I was on the back deck one day, and there'd been a plane in the sky doing some lovely sky riding. There was a streak here and a streak there. It was both intricate and appealing to look at. Then there was an apparent shift in the wind at a high altitude as the sun began to set. Gradually, there formed the most beautiful dark blue and sunset-drenched clouds in the sky as if they were a broad brush stroke from an artist's paintbrush. They were amazing. I recall laughing to myself. Here I had been admiring the work of a creative sky rider. Then it was as if God the Creator said, You think that's something? Well, watch this. In each of these reflections are demonstrated the immensity and greatness of our Creator, the one who keeps all things in existence, including us, by simply keeping them in His eternal mind. So should we have any doubt that so great a God could ever possibly be anything less than perfectly merciful and perfectly just? A bad effect of Protestantism on modern Catholics, made easy for us to accept because of our own fallen human nature, is the overemphasis on God's mercy and forgiveness. I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about mercy and forgiveness. Heavens no. We need mercy and forgiveness. But in Protestantism, especially the prevalent fundamentalist school of thought, the theological idea is that we only have to accept Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior to get into heaven. 
then we can do pretty much as we please because we're covered by the blood of Jesus. This is what they call security to the believer. If this were true, by that logic, there was never a need for the Ten Commandments for Christians and the entire Old Testament is superfluous. Security to the believer and its implications for redemption and salvation pretty much make us all think that when we die, we'll immediately be taking the celestial express to the pearly gates. That's just plain wrong. Will you really be saved when you die? How do you know? St. Paul told us to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling in Philippians 2.12. Does that sound like a man who believes that going to heaven is a cakewalk? A God as immense and magnificent as ours doesn't waste time on anything. He has a purpose behind everything. When he gave us the Ten Commandments and gave the church the authority to make precepts that we must obey under pain of sin, he was foolish to do that if we're all automatically going to heaven. Don't buy into the lies of the world that basically say, if it feels good, you should do it or that you deserve it. Don't buy into the errors of Protestantism that give us the false assurance of salvation. The Catholic moral code must be obeyed, and your eternal destiny depends on it. Obey the commandments of the church. In order to obey them, you have to know them, as well as all that they imply. As the little boy's dad said, the commandments of God and of the church is our level. Live according to that, and you won't be taking any chances with your soul. You can do a good job in life only if you use that level. You'll always only find joy and contentment, even in times of hardship, living by the level. That's also the only way you can achieve heaven. Learn things about the Catholic faith you never knew in Joe Sixpack's Secrets of the Catholic Faith. There are many essentials to our holy and ancient faith that few modern Catholics know. Those essentials have become, well, secrets, hence the title Secrets of the Catholic Faith. Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, is always exciting, never boring, and completely politically incorrect. He never shies away from the so-called untouchable moral issues. With his use of humor and directness, readers and students can never get enough of what he teaches. According to Joe, there isn't one single teaching of the Catholic Church that can't be completely demonstrated to an inquiring mind. Everything can be demonstrated. But the Catholic laity aren't being taught these things. They're being fed pablum when they need and want meat. Secrets of the Catholic Faith is actually exciting, and it will make any Catholic's chest swell with pride. So get your copy of Secrets of the Catholic Faith by Joe Sixpack, the Every Catholic Guy, today in print or ebook on Amazon, Apple Books, Barnes and Noble, and Kobo. The Catholic Church is 2,000 years old. A lot of wisdom is gained over two millennia. Each week we'll share some of that wisdom with a Catholic quote. So here's this week's Catholic quote. This week's Catholic quote is from St. Alphonsus Liguori. He said, Of all devotions, that of adoring Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament is the greatest after the sacraments the one dearest to God, and the one most helpful to us. I believe a really great way to teach the faith is through stories, parables, and anecdotes. So here's today's story. A farmer who owned a large, profitable, and well-organized farm often promised his children that he'd leave it all to them after his death. He said to them, It'll be a sign of the love I have for you, my children. I'll leave you better provided for than I was when I was starting out as a young man. Some years later, when the father took sick, the doctor assured him that he only had a few more hours to live. The dying man called his children to his bedside. I want you to know, he said, my last will and testament. The children remembered the promise he'd often repeated. They watched as he reached under his pillow and took out a picture of his farm. 
This is what I leave you, my children, a picture of my farm. It'll be a symbol, a reminder of me. The children were surprised to hear these words come from their father. They whispered to each other, Surely Dad must be out of his mind. He'd never say goodbye to us by making a mockery of what he'd told us before. If he were in his right mind, surely he wouldn't make a joke of his last will by leaving us a picture of the farm instead of the real thing. The picture means nothing to us. It's no reminder of his love for us. Those who say that in the Lord's Supper Christ gave us not what he promised, not his real body and blood, but only a symbol, a picture of it, a piece of bread and wine to remind us of him, make Jesus act like the farmer in this story. They make him a liar. Jesus promised us his real body and blood two years before the Last Supper when he said, The bread that I will give you is my flesh for the life of the world. Therefore, when he said, This is my body, he meant his real body, not a picture or remembrance of it. The bread was changed into his body, and the wine was changed into his blood. This has been The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Thanks for subscribing, and be sure to visit cantankerouscatholic.com to get your free copy of Joe's popular book, The Best of What We Believe, Why We Believe It. 